This is an oral history interview with Leo Boranek. It's September 30th, 2008. I'm Forrest Larson in the MIT Lewis Music Library. It's my honor and privilege to welcome Leo Boranek for an interview. It's September 30th, 2008. We're in the MIT Lewis Music Library. Leo was Associate Professor of Communications Engineering at MIT from 1947 to 1958 and continued as lecturer from 1958 to 1981. He was also founding member, founding partner of Bolt, Brannock and Newman Incorporated, 1948 to 1983, and he has been an internationally respected acoustical design consultant. Thank you very much for, for coming. This is a delight to have you. I'm very pleased to be here, and I hope I can answer your questions. Oh, I think you'll, you're going to do wonderful. All right, some basic um, biographical um, information. Can you tell me what year um, you were born and, and where? I was born in 1914, actually in September. And I was born in a small town in Iowa called Solon, S-O-L-O-N, a town with a population of, at that time, of maybe 500 people. And, but uh, I was born in the town, and my father had been operating with his, his father a livery stable, which meant they were running a taxi business with horses. And then the, the Model T came in, and that business went under, so my father had to go back to farming on the, on the basic uh, Baronic farm, that was a homestead farm, uh, and is so designated. Now, your father's name was Edward. Is that Edward. correct? Edward. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your your um, your mother at the time. Well, my mother was uh, born of of German parents. Uh, they were born in this country, but they too came over just as the, the uh, Czechoslovakian parents on my father's side came over just about 1850. And so the family, the two families, had been here since 1850. The, the German family, with my mother's side, uh, he, my grandfather was a, was a builder. He, he, uh, he assembled groups that put up buildings, and uh, uh, he was quite good at this. And my mother then went to Iowa State Teachers College and learned to handle uh, at least uh, elementary school teaching. And before she was married, she did teach in elementary school for a few years. Then after she got married, she stopped that. And your mother's name was Beatrice? Beatrice, yeah. right. Um, and then um, you had a stepmother named Frances? Is that Frances, her? right. Yeah. Well, my mother died when I was 11, and then within a year or so later, my father married Frances. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about, about Frances. Well, I don't know much about her anymore. Uh, she was born of Czechoslovakian, uh, Czech, Czech, I should use the word Czech, Czech parents, uh, and uh, uh, she had lived in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and that's about all I know about her. I never uh -huh. really looked up her past. Okay, okay. And then you had w one sibling, a brother named Lyle? That's right. Yeah. And he was born uh, seven years after me and was uh, there for four years old when my mother died. I was 11. So um, is Lyle still with us? No, Lyle uh, was deceased about three, four years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Tell me a little bit about Lyle and what his profession was. Well, Lyle was stayed on the farm. Uh, he, he decided to be a farmer, and of course, Iowa land, very rich, and he had a good farm and ran a big dairy and had help on the farm. He employed people to help him, and they, they both raised uh, animals like hogs and cattle and they also uh, sold corn, and they sold milk. Fantastic. Um, I come from a family of my father's side came from Iowa Farms, too, yeah. and so I know all about that. <laughs> and, and tell me about your, um, your, your wife, Phyllis. Uh, right. 
Well, Phyllis was born and raised in Boston. She went to the Boston public schools and then went to Forsyth uh, to be a dental hygienist. And uh, uh, she uh, was very good at languages. She enjoyed literature. But of course, as a dental hygienist, she did not get a real full college education. I got acquainted with her when I had my teeth fixed. <laughs> found that she was a very bright and alert person, and we made friends with each other. Fantastic. And then um, your second wife, Gabriella? Gabriella. Yeah. Well, my wife died in 1982, I think, and uh, uh, then for three years I was, of course, single and lived in Winchester still in our house. And my wife and I have been very close friends to a couple named Donald and Gabriella Sohn, S-O-H-N. And he was, he was president of the Heritage uh, Travel Agency in town, which at that time was a principal travel agency. And uh, uh, then she decided apparently to get a divorce from him, and I heard about this. And since we'd been very close friends of two couples, then I looked her up, and that's how this ended up in the marriage. <laughs> mm. So going back to your um, childhood, um, your first musical experiences, did you take piano lessons like many young people well, did? Well, I, I started to take piano lessons, but I seemed to have so, so much more to do otherwise in school and so on that I, I didn't get very interested in it. I found that uh, uh, I found it took a lot of work. It took time. My mother played quite well, and she was very disappointed that I didn't become more proficient. Of course, I learned to read music and play simple things, but nothing, nothing that she would say was piano playing. Well, you said your mother played quite well. Do you remember what kind of music she played? And any pieces or? Well, well she played. Uh, uh, she played. A standard sort of piano music. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any detail because I never uh, really was that interested in the uh -huh. piano. But she would sit down and play things that list and that kind of thing yeah. that were uh, standard piano fare. Mm -hmm. Did she play any ragtime as well? Do you remember? I don't think so. I uh -huh. think it was all more uh, more concert piano mm -hmm. type of thing. Could she also improvise? No. No. I never heard that. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, you also sang in the church choir, right? That's right. Well, my mother uh, was a director of the church choir. It was a Catholic church, and I was sort of went to two churches, I think I told in my autobiography, mm -hmm. where my grandmother and my mother were all Catholics, and my grandfather and his sons, three of them, were all Protestants. The result was that we went to the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church both. And I used to uh, sing in the Catholic Church choir on Sundays, and we would go to the Methodist Episcopal Church for sermons on Sunday evening. <laughs> <laughs> what voice part did you sing in the choir? Oh, I, I know I was uh, under 11, so I... Oh, you... I, I suppose I don't know what I was saying. Probably sing one of the high parts. Did, you, did so. you sing in the choir after your voice broke? Uh, not really. Uh, I tried a little bit in Cornell, but I never really had time. I, I went one time with a, with a choral group and sang a little. Uh, I was singing sort of bass, although not a very good bass, and uh, I didn't keep at it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know, my voice is not very good. It was not very good then, so that was one reason also I didn't get interested. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what kind of music the, the choir sang? Was there any pieces you remember? Or oh, not, per not particularly. They were out of the standard uh, mm -hmm. hymnal. Yeah. Were there any things with um, any kind of classical type, type pieces, you know, Mendelssohn or um, Brahms or anything like that, or were they more just... Um, you know, do, do you remember? No, 
All I remember is singing out of the hymnal. Okay, yeah. So it might have been mostly just um, singing the hymns. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, were there any particular moments in singing in the church choir that, that you remember f fondly? Any, any experiences with that? Well, I remember one time she had me sing a solo uh, in the church, and this received criticism because uh, some other people said their children sang better than I did. And she put me in there because I was her son. And so there was some little bit of annoyance among their, her friends about uh -huh. this. <laughs> Do you remember what song that was that you sang? No, I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. Did your father um, play or sing? No. 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 Did your family go to concerts? Um, well, there were really no concerts uh, uh, in in my family's, uh, this was Solon, Iowa, and then my father went to Mount Vernon, and he did, never was interested in music, so uh, I did not really go to concerts until I went to Cornell College. Okay. Did you listen to uh, phonograph records? Now, let's see. We didn't have a phonograph. What we did have was a radio. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days, it's, radio was very simple. Uh, and uh, my father bought a, a one-tube Crosley set in 19, I think it was 1924, and I was very interested in this as a mechanical device. I tried to learn how it went. The only thing I can really remember was that I listened many nights to a pianist from the state prison in Jefferson City, Missouri. Yeah, Harry Snodgrass? Harry Snodgrass. Yeah. And he was called King of the Ivories on the air. And he was very fascinating because he talked about his music and then played it. And he had a very large audience. And he was in the state prison. Right. And eventually they pardoned him. And when they pardoned him, he didn't play anymore. So. Right. It was amazing. His career went down right after he, he left, left prison. And, um, I heard on the web, there's some web um, clips of his playing. And he really? Was, he was an amazing pianist. Well, it sounded good to me. Yeah, uh, I was I was quite impressed. Uh, he was in prison for for armed robbery. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I guess after he was pardoned, that um, he kept to the straight and narrow. Um, so, in your memoir, you said you um, um, that the salon. Um, school band leader urged you to play an instrument and you um, chose to play drum. How did that come about? Well, uh, actually the the conductor of the band was also a fellow who did most of the teaching. And this was Saul and I, a small town, of course. And uh, he wanted to have a band in, the, in our high school, in our school there, which turned out to be a high school band. And uh, he needed some instruments, so he he tried to talk me into playing a bass horn, and I did take a bass horn back. Now this was already after my mother died, and we had moved. My father and son, uh, other son and I, had moved into uh, my grandmother's home, and I brought this bass horn home. Was it a tuba? Do you? Yeah, tuba. Yeah, yeah. a tuba, and she uh, she didn't like this at all, so mm -hmm. I gave up on the tuba quick. Then uh, the, the band guy gave me a trombone, and I wasn't particularly interested in the trombone, and so he then said, well, why don't you learn drums? And so that's what I took up. And he encouraged me to get a marching drum, which was a drum that was about, uh, about I would say, 14 inches in diameter, and it had a depth to it of about 14 inches and you would march with it bouncing on your knee. And uh, I think my father had to buy that. I don't know where he got it, except there was musical stores in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which was about 15 miles away from Solon. Mm -hmm. And I think he went to Cedar Rapids to buy this drum. Um, in the, the school um, band director, do you remember his name? I don't. Yeah. I just don't. Um, and you took lessons with him, right? That's right. Yeah. And he got a book. I had a book uh, of how to play a drum, <laughs> mm -hmm. an instructional book. And also, I had a rubber pad on a slanting board, 
and I could play on the rubber pad without disturbing my grandmother. Right. <laughs> and if I wanted to play the drum, I had to go over it on the school grounds, which was nearby, uh -huh. and march around out there make, making noise. Uh -huh. What was it like learning all the rudiments, you know, the, those basic um, patterns? Well, it seemed that I understood, of course, I knew how to read music. Yeah. And I understood, uh, understood measures and beats and so on. And so I could read this drum music and put the put the rhythm to it properly. Mm -hmm. Right, and then um, and I also had a metronome. Ah, uh -huh. so, so I could keep <laughs> keep my time straight. Yeah. Great, and when did you get a, a drum set? Well, I don't remember exactly, but it was about the time I was beginning to be a freshman in high school, and I spent my freshman year still in. Solon, Iowa, and my father uh, knew a a fellow in Solon who had been a drummer, a ba dance band drummer, and uh, apparently he knew I was playing drums in the band, and he asked my father if if he didn't think I should have a a set of trap drums, and my father bought them, and so. And that was sort of done without even consulting me. He just up and bought them. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to learn those. Uh -huh. And so I then, uh, then I did some listening on the radio. Uh, we didn't play many phonograph records, I must say, in Solon. I was mainly interested in radio. Mm -hmm. And I would listen to bands play in radio. And of course, Sousa's band was very prominent in those days. And it was one that I would try and catch whenever I heard it. They were playing on radio. As I remember, the United States Army, Sousa was an Army States Army band. I think they played regularly on the radio, and I'd listen. Mm -hmm. And then that helped me in the marching band. And then the jazz band I could get from listening to the orchestras. The dance orchestras. Dance yeah, orchestras. Right. How often did you get a chance to hear them? Say that again. How often did you get a chance to hear dance orchestras? Well, I would say on radio this was fairly easy. Mm -hmm. I can't uh, give you any schedule of listening. Yeah, right. Just, just but, did it. But it, it was fairly, fairly right. common there. Um, were there any particular um, dance orchestras that, that caught your ear that you were interested in? Well, of course, I listened to the big bands, too, mm -hmm. uh, which were the thing of that time. Uh, and... Uh, I don't know, the Dorsey Brothers, I was always interested in their drumming. And uh, then uh, Cab Kellaway had a pretty vigorous drummer, as I remember, mm -hmm. that I listened to. Mm -hmm. Now, I never got to be a spectacular drummer, and I didn't try to, to jazz people with great things. I played really basic drums that put a, a solid foundation in a dance band. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit more about how you, what you saw your role as, um, I, as you said, you weren't trying to be flashy, but just trying to pr provide a, 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 a solid background. Did you do like fills between um, choruses and stuff like that sometimes? Well, sometimes. It was not uh, as flashy as, mm -hmm. <laughs> as the great drummers. I yeah. was not a Gene Krupa. Yeah. Uh, they, I was interested in what they did, but I just didn't... Uh, didn't try to be that flashy, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I say I did put a good basic uh, beat for the orchestra dance band, mm -hmm. and did play cymbals and blocks and yeah and and tom toms and this kind of thing when it seemed appropriate. Right, but not big flashy stuff. Mm -hmm. It seemed like it was an innovative thing that Joe Jones had done was using more of the 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 hi hat to provide some rhythmic impulse and less on the, the bass drum, which had been more traditional. Did, did you ever remember um, hearing about um, his innovations there, or did that? No, not really. I, not really. I stuck to the bass yeah. drum as a, mm -hmm. as a, as a foundation. Mm -hmm. So you played with a group called Polly and his Parrots, um, <laughs> and was led by a saxophonist named Wilbur Powers. Tell right. me about how you joined that group. Well. I was, of course, play, I was now, I should say that the end of my freshman year, my father then was when he married Frances, and we moved to Mount Vernon. And Mount Vernon, I was a town now of about 3,000. 
and then also the town where Cornell College was in. And incidentally, Cornell College is 12 years older than, than Cornell Ithaca, and it's a liberal arts school with about a thousand students today, and it was roughly that number then. And uh, so he moved to Mount Vernon and joined with a first cousin of his to open a hardware store, which was called Baronic Hardware. And uh, uh, so uh, we then we'd moved to Mount Vernon then at the beginning of my or the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, and then I started going to Mount Vernon High School, and then they asked me to play in the high school band in Mount Vernon. Right. I looked them up and mm -hmm. volunteered. Anyhow, they took me to be a drummer in the in the in the high school band, and I think there were only two or three of us uh, that played the the drums in the band. And uh, Polly, uh, the saxophone player, I don't know really what experience he had uh, as a uh, prior to my getting to know him, but he was a good saxophone player. And he apparently heard me in the high school band and then looked me up and decided they were going to form Polynesian Parrots. So he put together a group of local people. The, I remember the bass horn player was named uh, Climo or Klima, uh, and he was uh, a very proper local uh, man. He was sort of the station master for the Northwestern, uh, the um, the Northwestern Railway that went through Mount Vernon, and uh, the Union Pacific Railway went through Mount Vernon. And uh, he, uh, uh, that was a bass horn player. Then we had, I forget now, it's in my autobiography, we had a trumpet player, piano player, and, uh, and of course I was drums, and there was another, what, what else was it? It was a banjo, I think, we had. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, and this group was kind of a, a crazy group. <laughs> I, I'd have to almost look it up in my autobiography to get them right. I don't remember their names too well now, except I had kept a record in my diary. When I wrote the autobiography, I wrote them down. But the piano player was a young woman, and she kind of stayed away from all the rough talk that went on. But uh, one of the players uh, always was telling stories about his escapades with married women in, in Mount Vernon. And uh, uh, Polly was also known for chasing young women around. And uh, uh, the, the bass arm player was very dignified, and I was too busy to be interested in chasing women then, so I didn't get involved in those stories. Do you remember what kinds of um, um, tunes the, the band played? Um. Oh boy, I don't remember things by names. Uh, Were they popular songs, or, um, or or was it actual kind of big band kind it of? It was big band pieces we yeah. were playing, mm -hmm. and uh, Polly mm -hmm. would pick those, and uh, I usually did not have any any music, mm -hmm. like uh, most drummers. Yeah, you know, uh, he he would get the pieces and we'd rehearse, and I'd try and fit in mm -hmm. my what little specialty I did, besides just basic playing, uh, in with what I heard, mm -hmm. and he would encourage me when he thought it was sounded right. Mm -hmm. So um, you attended um, Cornell College um, in Mount Vernon, Iowa, 1931 to 1936, and you graduated with a BA degree in mathematics and physics. Is That's that correct. right? Yeah. Um, you told me you played in a college orchestra. Is that where you started playing timpani? Yes. Uh, at first I played uh, just drums, uh, general percussion mm -hmm. in the orchestra. That's They had a timpani player already. And then the timpani player was going to graduate. And so that would leave without a timpani player probably when I was a junior. I can't quite remember which year that transition took place. But I say, first in the orchestra, I played general percussion. That could be a bass drum sometimes, and sometimes cymbals, and sometimes snare drum, whatever the music called for. Did you ever play any xylophone or marimba? Yes, yes I did. I oh, played, you did? I played the xylophone. We didn't have a marimba, but the band did have a, a xylophone, which I played. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't terribly 
uh, brilliant on that, but I could get, get the pieces right. And uh, so that was also part of my, uh, my uh, percussion that went in the orchestra. Then the timpani player was going to graduate. And I think I was going to be a junior. And so the, the uh, conductor said, well, look, you better learn to play the timpani. I don't have any other person. I don't see any other person in Cornell that's available to play timpani. And so I then, then, then I should say that, that the Boston, the Chicago Symphony came to Mount Vernon, Iowa every spring uh, and played uh, one weekend of concerts there. This was in May, and we had the May Music Festival. So the, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra came, and in the orchestra, of course, was our timpani player, whose name was Metzinger, Edward right. Metzinger. And uh, so I, uh, besides I'm going to have to pay timpani, I'd better get acquainted with these drummers. <laughs> so I took them out to a meal, even though I was in college, and we had a local restaurant there. And uh, they they uh, li listened to me, and I said to Metzinger, I'd like to have you teach me uh, to play the timpani. Well, he said, why don't you come to Chicago, and uh, I'll give you a lessons. Well, this wasn't too bad, because you had these very fast, fine streamliners in those days, high speed. And you could leave Mount Vernon on an early train in the morning, and I could get my lesson for him and come back on a late afternoon train. And I would, didn't have to stay in any hotels. And, and uh, it was mainly a matter of getting the railway fare for students was fairly cheap. And it was one day only. And so I took lessons from him, I would say, about, uh, about uh, every two months. It wasn't very often. Mm -hmm. Maybe at first every month for a little bit. And then I did every two months after that. And he taught me pretty much how to be a good timpani player. Mm -hmm. Besides learning specific things, technical things about the timpani, did he teach you any other larger kind of musical issues and just kind of being a, a, a musician? Did, were there other things you learned from him about that? Um, I don't know what that would include because uh, he would bring up different different tip, tip, timpani parts from the symphonies mm -hmm. and then show me how those were uh, were, were to be done and try to instruct me also in when to be loud and when to be looking at the music and how to how to judge my level of loudness compared to the rest of the orchestra mm -hmm. which is very important the timpani cannot be too loud and if it's not loud enough you're not there so you got to pretty well judge another difficult thing for me was tuning in those days uh, Cornell did not have a pedal timpani although Metzinger did and so I had to tune by mm -hmm. a six or so screws around the edge. And uh, I found this difficult. Uh, difficult, particularly since you had to tune them all when you had it, and that's one of the orchestras playing, and get the thing right. Now, I did not have absolute pitch, but what I tried to do was to, was to induce in me an absolute pitch. So I had a little... Uh, uh, what do you call pitch it? Pitch pipe. Pitch pipe is the word I want. Little yeah. pitch pipe, and every, and I carried it with me, and, and wherever it seemed convenient, I would sound the thing, and then I would try and make that note before I would sound it, as time went on, and I found that I I could get pretty close. Now I I didn't have absolute pitch, but I could get sort of built into me a pitch that matched this this thing, and that meant then that in the orchestras I could sort of now start judging from my built-in pitch what the what the score called for. Mm -hmm. But I had to tune these damn things. <laughs> and I found that very difficult. And of course, I never did have at Cornell a te pedal timpani, which would have been w wonderful. Wow. Where when you move it, all you move all your yeah. things at once. Right, and with, when you have the screws, you, you can't just, each screw has to be, tuned right. because otherwise the head is not in tune with itself. That's right. So, it's very, yeah. very particular. Yeah. Um. But I got by and in fact I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote. The uh, One of the bass players from the Chicago Symphony's home had been in Mount Vernon 
So he came out to visit his parents when I guess the orchestra wasn't playing in Chicago. And then he came to a concert by the, uh, by the uh, local uh, Cornell College Orchestra. And of course I was a timpani player. And he did compliment me on how I did in that particular performance. Do you remember what piece you did on that, that concert? What pieces? I don't know. I, I almost think it might have been the Unfinished Symphony. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, I do. The only one I remember particularly that was something that was special that I did was, um, was Dvorak's uh, World, New, New World Symphony. Yeah. Uh, later, when I, at Cornell, I took a year off and went to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and worked for a company called the Collins Radio Company. And the Cedar Rapids had a Cedar Rapids Symphony. And uh, for some reason, I got to playing kettle drums in the Cedar Rapids Symphony. I don't remember what happened, why. And then uh, a, they, they were having a celebration of Dvorak in Spillville, Iowa. Right. Now it's often said that he wrote part of the New, Ville, the New World Symphony in Spillville, so they had a festival in Spillville, and the Cedar Rapids Symphony came and played in that festival, and we played the New World Symphony, and I remember in particular uh, how that felt being in, at a festival. Fantastic. How long did you play with the Cedar Rapids Symphony? Just one year, when I was in Cedar Rapids. Somewhere in my notes, I had the name of the 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 conductor that might have. Um, uh, where? Oh, I don't uh, have this in my yeah. memory. Um, anyways, uh, I'll find that in a second. Um, you mentioned that the. Um, Chicago Symphony played at the um, the Spring Festival at, at Cornell. Was um, was that the first time you'd heard a, a live um, symphony orchestra? That's true. Uh, I listened always on radio, and of course the loudspeakers of that time were pretty poor. And uh, now the way to tell you the big thrill I had, I was uh, selling programs to sort of earn my way into the concert. And so I was outside selling programs. Then just as the orchestra would start playing, I could, I could push in through a door and sit down. They had a seat for me and right near the door. And so the, the, the big thrill, the biggest thrill in music I've ever had is going through that door and hearing a great orchestra playing. And of course, they were playing some overture. I can believe it was pretty peppy at the, at the beginning, and it was just absolutely mind-boggling to hear the music this way. I'd never heard anything like that. I must have left obviously a lasting impression on you because you're, yeah. um, you know, you're. You see, our our college symphony never sounded like the Chicago symphony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, asking you. Just a little bit more about the Cedar Rapids Symphony. The conductor could have been this gentleman, Joseph Kitchen. Um, God, he, it sounds familiar. He was conductor from 1921 through 1952. Yeah, well, that sounds like uh -huh. a name. I wouldn't have remembered it. Uh-huh. Um, and it started out as an amateur orchestra, but it became a professional group, and it was sometime in the, the, um, the early... 50s that it became a professional group. When you were playing, was it still a, an amateur group? Do you remember? Or were you paid? Well, it was a mixture of, of, of union okay, players. Okay, so it was a mixture by that point. Mixture, yeah. yeah okay. Of union players and non-union players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you remember any particular pieces you played with them? So you played the Dvorak. Yeah. Was there some others? Oh, I don't you remember, remember now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember kind of how they played, um, how well they played? Was it a, a pretty decent group? Did you? Well, it was better than the college symphony. Mm -hmm. They were more skilled. And, of course, they had their solo, play, their first desk players were probably pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I always felt that it was a great pleasure to be in that professional group. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a professional group yeah. to me. Right. Um, 
You also mentioned that the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, you also heard the Chicago Symphony and the Detroit Symphony. Um, um, but you, so you, I guess you had heard the Chicago Symphony earlier at the, the Cornell Spring Festival, right? right. Um, um, anything you want to mention um, more about hearing the Chicago Symphony? Um, um, and was Frederick Stock um, conducting? He was the conductor. Yeah. And I did get a chance to talk with him. And uh, uh, he was a, a, a very warm fellow. He was a fellow who liked to connect with audiences. In fact, he often talked from the, from the stage to his audiences. Uh, I remember, for example, one time they had one of these bell trees. And he turned around and spoke to the audience about the history of a bell tree and and then he says well he said don't worry about the tone quality it's kind of a jumble anyhow <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he, he did talk and, uh, and he would sometimes describe a, a piece that they're going to play and point out what was different about that the audience should listen for mm -hmm. Were there any soloists with the uh, Chicago Symphony in any of those concerts you went to? Any concerto soloists? I'm trying to think. Um, what's the matter with I do? I did get to know the, the concert master. Do you remember? And the concert master left there and became the concert master in the Detroit Symphony. Do you remember who that was? The name? Oh, gee, I should. Yeah. It, it should come to me, but I don't. Can't call it up at the minute. No, it was it was a good name. Uh -huh. He was a very well known. I think that he reached some retirement age in the in the Chicago orchestra, and then the Detroit orchestra kept him for a few more years. Uh -huh. um, any comments about the Detroit Symphony? Um, any because you heard them at the the, the, the Chicago World's Fair. Um, well. As far as I was concerned, it was first-class symphony. Mm -hmm. I thought that uh, I thought in my listening to them at the fair, they sound equally good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Detroit Symphony conductor was Osip Gabrilovich. That could have been. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like those um, experiences left a, a lifelong impression they on did. you. They yeah. did. Um, now, the, at the Chicago Fair, each orchestra played two one-hour concerts a day. And so there were four one-hour concerts available, and I was trying to get to one of those each day. Wow. In your memoir, you also mentioned um, at the, the fair there were some, some dance bands that were playing. Um, That's right, the big bands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember who some of those groups were? Well, of course, I remember Cab Calloway. I remember the Darcy's. Um, of course, Wayne King. Uh, let's see, what are some more names uh, mm -hmm. of that time? Count Basie? Possibly? I didn't. Count Basie, I don't remember so uh -huh. much. Or Benny Goodman? Benny Goodman, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And these big bands were also came through Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They had a dance floor there. And it was regular that they, these big bands would tour the United States. Mm -hmm. And Cedar Rapids got them regularly, too. Fantastic. Um, so one of my reasons for asking about some of your, your musical background, it's just interesting um, in and of itself, but also I um, want to ask you, your work as an acoustician, um, um, you know, there, there's a, a level of musical understanding that you, um, that you have and that you gain the respect of of conductors and, and, and musicians, and you understand the performance needs of, of world-class musicians um, and how a, a hall can, can, can affect that. Um, can you talk about how you kind of got that, that musical knowledge and ex expertise, um, how, how you got to that level? Um, well, I think See, I think, I think how to how to uh, how to express this. Uh, first of all, when I came to graduate school in 1936, 
the first year I just studied. The second year I became a, an assistant uh, to Professor uh, Ted Hunt, who's an acoustics man at Harvard. And I got my, eventually, he was my thesis uh, professor also. But he had tickets regularly to the Boston Symphony. And those were in Symphony Hall. And uh, he, he also had, they had a new baby. And so they wanted some babysitter, and I was now his assistant. And so he'd have me come and sit in his home with the baby while they went to the symphony. And then on, I don't know, once a month or so, he'd give me tickets to go to the symphony. And they didn't go. Maybe it was twice a month, I don't remember. But I got in the Boston Symphony Hall quite often in that period from 1937 to 19. Uh, 38 or 39, I guess 37, 38, up until the summer of 39. Then after that, the orchestra played at Saunders Theater. They used to have what they called the Cambridge Series. And that's the Boston Symphony. Mm -hmm. And so I would go by student rush seats to the, uh, to the concerts of the Boston Symphony. So I got to hear the Boston Symphony both in uh, in the in Symphony Hall and also in Saunders Theater, mm -hmm. and uh, I begin to get appreciation. And of course, being a a timpani player, I also paid attention to the, mm -hmm. what the what the percussion session was doing. And uh, I feel that my the start of my understanding of what the orchestra needed was listening to music in these two places. Oh yes. And then, um, I can't say what year I first went out to Tanglewood, but I got to Tanglewood one, one weekend, one summer, and got to hear the orchestra and still a third venue, and began to see there is a difference in these places. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any music theory or music history courses in no. college? No, no. no. Um, so I think you it looks like you just made it a, 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 a personal um, mission to, to learn this stuff on, That's right. on your own. And um, um, I was also wondering um, your experience as a percussionist um, did it help you train your ear to hear um, qualities and parameters of sound? Um, you know that um, there's particular kinds of non musical things. Um, that percussionists have to kind of pay attention to, they're, and they're, they're sensitive to other kinds of sounds. Do you think that also helped you in your acoustics work? You know? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh -huh. It probably did. Mm -hmm. There would be something subconscious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wondered about that. Um, I also wonder, um, as as an acoustician and some of the work you did um, with noise abatement and and you know aircraft engines, you were obviously listening to these. Um, you had to listen to these sounds very attentively. Did some of those sounds um, fascinate you just um, on a on a just because they were fun to listen to or aesthetic? You just enjoyed the sound. You know, there are certain certain engines that are have real rich, um, you know, um, pitch and, and harmony. Did, did you ever find yourself listening? I to never found anything very favorable about any engines uh -huh. I dealt with. Uh -huh. They were always nuisances. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> um, the one of the things I spent a lot of time on when we first formed my consulting company was trying to determine how quiet you want different rooms. You want a, a symphony hall to be much quieter than you do an office building, and it can be much quieter than a factory building. But, but now if you want to write specifications for how the building is built, you've got to have some, some numbers that you know. What numbers do you have for the acceptable noise levels in a symphony hall? What are acceptable noise levels in a in a uh, office building and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I went into a detailed study of that. And I did then form the basic curves, which are, which the curves meaning 
the noise levels are permissible in about eight different frequency bands, starting at low frequencies up to high frequencies. And so you get them at all frequencies. And those curves are in use today. They're basic curves on how quiet different venues should be. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, tell me about your um, early childhood interest in science and engineering. It looks like it was kind of through radio that radio. you got into that. Well, I think I started to mention that a father bought this one tube, Crosley, and he let me then sort of have it to make it work. He just bought it and brought it home. Mm -hmm. We had to put an antenna up outdoors in those days. You couldn't uh, have rabbit's ears and and those old time sets, they weren't powerful enough. So you had an antenna that had to be at least a sort of 70, 80 feet long. So I had to put that up outdoors and get it through the window with strips that went under the window. And uh, you had to have a ground, in, uh, a, a metal thing you stuck in the ground, which is called a ground post, and a wire that came up from this under the window. And you had the one that came from the antenna in the window. Those two then went into the Crosley set. And then I soon figured out how, how a set really worked. What, what we were varying was something they call a capacitor. And, and, there, and then I was reading about, uh, about uh, what, what I could get in the, in the library and get some books on radio. And I could read about what made radio work. So I got quite interested in radio. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned um, recording speech students at um, at Cornell College, and That's that got right. you interested in. Well, that was uh, the it, the the in speech instructor there talked with me one time. Said it'd be nice if he could record his students at the beginning of a year and the end of a year, but he says I we can't afford any recording equipment. So I went and studied the what was being sold and found that you could buy a recorder that recorded on aluminum discs of all things. It embossed a, a signal into them. And I could buy this thing such that if I could get his students to pay me a dollar a record at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, I could afford to buy the machine and make the recordings for him. I didn't make any money off of this, but I did get his recordings made. And occasionally through the years, I would have Cornell students uh, see that my name was on those records, and they would find out from the alumni office how to contact me, and they'd say, we have these records, of course, we can't play them because they're aluminum, and uh, can, you, can you figure out a way to transcribe what's on those so we could listen to them? Well, I found a company, in, I think in Seattle, that would take those things, with, they took a wooden needle, a fiber needle, and to play on the aluminum, and they could do that, and they would transcribe these records. Uh -huh. And I actually have a couple records of, of the Cornell College Dance Band that I played in that we I recorded on those aluminum discs. Oh, I'd be very interested to hear some of that. I could give you those. Yeah. I, yes. Okay. We would yes. Be, be very interested in, in hearing that. Um, um, I want to ask you when you. Um, were um, director of the Harvard Electroacoustics Laboratory, um, 1940 through 46. Um, you built an anechoic chamber, right. um, and they sometimes called it Baranek's Box. Um, there's a famous story. The um, composer John Cage, sometime in the late um, 40s or early 50s, visited that chamber. He wanted to experience silence, um, and he went in there with the, the engineer, um, and he heard a high frequency sound and a low frequency sound, and the engineer told him it was his, his blood circulation and his, his nervous system. Now, whether that's true or not, but it, he had the fundamental revelation that there really is no such thing as silence. I'm wondering, when you were in there, what was your experience, and kind of what, what did you hear? Well, of course, this, this was the quietest place that anybody's ever been in. Yeah. And indeed, what I heard was the blood rushing in my ears. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is that is the basis for a, as quiet as you can you can get anything. Mm -hmm. What's that experience like though in that in that that chamber? It, it, well, as you walk in, of course, you're carrying 
the noise of outside with you and you'll have to stand for a while and let your ears sort of forget what you've been listening to. If there's a carryover. You carry that sound with you for a little while. You go into this very quiet room and gradually you suddenly become aware that what you're hearing only is the blood rushing in your ears. And it's absolute quiet. Now about the John Cage story, I was a professor then at MIT and somebody called me and wanted to know if uh, I could take John Cage into this chamber. And I says, I can't, I'm too busy, but I'll give you the name of Professor Hunt, who was still there, and why don't you call him? And presumably Hunt arranged with Cage to come in. Uh-huh. I didn't, I couldn't do it. Oh, that's too bad. It been could have been, been a nice story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he did get into the chamber, no doubt about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. It was uh, one of those turning points for him as a, as a musician and artist. Um, so you came to MIT in 1947 to be the technical director of the um, Acoustics Laboratory. An interesting historical note you might be um, interested. The first MIT course catalog of 1865 lists a course called Elementary Mechanics, and part four is called Phenomena and Laws of Musical Sound. And some of the topics were um, reflection, refraction, musical sounds, intervals, musical instruments. So there, right from the very beginning, there was some acoustics taught um, at MIT. I found that... Um, I never heard that before. I found that really fascinating. It is fascinating. Uh, so the uh, acoustics lab started in 1931. Is that correct? Uh, that's what I was. my research says. So. But you came as technical director in '47. Um, well, now the acoustics lab formally did not start back then. Where did you get that note on there's that? A, there's a book on the history of the electrical engineering department, and there's a chapter on the the um, acoustics lab. Um, well, what I knew is the acoustics lab did not start until after the war. Uh -huh. So, if there was, I d I don't know what was there before. That it's true that there were acoustics being taught, no mm -hmm. doubt about it, and they must have had some laboratory space they were using. Right. But what we call the acoustics laboratory okay. didn't start till at, until after the war. Okay. And it started a year before I came there under Richard Bolt. Okay. He was the really the first he was there before me by one year. Okay. Um, so I was looking through your your papers in the archives um, and there's a description of um, uh, your course description for course 635 and 636, and you have this um, comment. Acoustics is a most fascinating subject. Music, architecture, engineering, science, drama, medicine, psychology, and linguistics all seek from it answers to basic questions in their fields. Um, that's an interesting statement. Um, is the, it must be the, the interdisciplinary nature of acoustics must have been very interesting to it you. Is. It is. And of course, in those early days, uh, the, the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, which was founded along in the 30s sometime, uh, had a limited number of papers in them. And the papers, because there weren't that many people in the field, and the papers ranged from speech and hearing people to musicians to uh, to. Uh, engineers who were doing uh, concert hall acoustics and so on, to engineers who were quieting machinery, and then underwater sound was always very important because of wartime, and big, the biggest money during the war went into underwater sound because that's where the, where the torpedoes and the submarines and all were. And uh, uh, so these things appeared in the journal, and I would read them all. I would be interested in, in the whole range of things. There were few enough papers that you could take time to read them all. Today you get a journal that's so thick, full of papers, that you you really don't have time to really mm -hmm. read them all. Mm -hmm. A question that I skipped that I should have asked you earlier, um, just what is it that um, got you into um, the, the field of acoustics as opposed to other things, that you know, other directions that you could have well, gotten? Of course. I think I tell in my autobiography that in between the the summer between my 
first and second year in graduate school. Uh, Professor Hunt, for the first time, got money from the dean to hire an assistant. And then he had to decide who he's going to ask to become his assistant. So he talked with some of the professors that had taught me in that first year that I was in graduate school. And they said that among the students they had that my grade record was as good as anybody that had straight A. And uh, also I seemed to be have some foundation in practical things because I had been fixing radios, you see, back in college. And so I knew practical things about radio. And they sensed this or learned it talking with me. And so they recommended the hunt he take asked me to be his assistant. Now he was acoustics. So I became his assistant. And in that first year his his plan was to try and invent a phonograph pickup that would be light enough that you could play vinyl records with it. And once he could do that, they went from the old shellac records, which is three minutes per side, to the LP record, which I think was 23 minutes per side. And you could use his kind of pickup on it. Now, he made the invention, and this got the big write-up in the journals. And uh, so that was my introduction to acoustics, and he led me into it right up to my ears. Mm -hmm. And so I got very interested in the field and decided to go into it. Mm -hmm. And what? of course, as I told you, he had me babysit and get tickets to the Boston mm -hmm. Symphony. <laughs> Was there something about just listening to sound itself that kind of fascinated you, that kind of put you in that direction? Because you could have gone in many other you know, technical fields with uh, the background that you had. Well, I found it fascinating because it involved music and speech and uh, uh, and there, there was a th this history of Sabine and the Symphony Hall mm -hmm. and things that I'd learned and it sounded like an interesting field to be in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Hunt helped make it interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So there, probably your your musical background was a, 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 a real contributing factor. Well, I would think so. Yeah, I would think so. Mm -hmm. um, so the um, um, uh, courses you taught at, at MIT, there were some um, acoustical engineering courses. Um, um, were there, uh, what other courses did you teach? Well, I, uh, when I came down there, they asked me to both teach a course in. The 635 course you mm -hmm. mentioned in acoustics and they asked me to also take part in the teaching of of students in electrical engineering so the first year that I was there I taught in a course in uh, circuit theory now of course I had studied at Harvard I had studied circuit theory as part of my training at Harvard so I came down there knowing this field and then the second year I did electromagnetics. And then the third year I actually did machinery, electrical machinery. But all these things had been, I'd learned about at Harvard too. So I went down there, trained in those fields. And so I not only taught every year an acoustics course, but I also taught in microengineering, one of the three areas I mentioned. I see. Um, so in the 635 course, um, I was reading that you um, taught microphone, you know, microphone and speaker design. Did you deal at all with acoustics of musical instruments in those no, courses? I never did. Uh -huh. I never paid any attention to the design of acoustical instruments. Uh -huh. Was there anybody um, in the laboratory doing research on musical instruments that you, at the time that you can recall? Well, the only thing that I now gets back to Harvard again was that Professor Saunders, who was an older acoustics man, was interested in studying the sound of violins. And you may, may remember in my autobiography, I tell about my day with Yasha Heifetz. Yeah. And so he was interested in, in trying to determine why the old violins, or, or in what way they differed from good modern violins. Why were they still so well liked? And so he was. He had a recording apparatus, which I sometimes helped run. 
because I was interested in the electronic side. And uh, that day that he invited Heifetz there, he asked me to be his recording assistant. So I was there running the recording apparatus while he was uh, uh, talking with Heifetz and getting Heifetz to perform. And we have a small anechoic chamber, not a very good one, but it was dead at least. And Heifetz performed in that uh, in that dead little dead space, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a case where he had his his uh, Stradivarius and his Guarnerius, and then we bought a, a violin that we picked up at a pawn shop, and we called it a Standard of Badness, which we gave him <laughs> to play. And when he, then he played a few note a little piece of piece some piece on that, and I heard this. And, his, I was standing next to his wife, and I said, boy, that violin never sounded like that before. And she said, he can make anything sound good. And that's the story I tell where I then, after he got through with these things, I said, uh, what did you think of our standard of badness? <laughs> he said, well, I was on a worse violin when I was performing in New Delhi uh, in India, and the, I came there only with my Strad, and I was to give a concert that evening. And horrors, I opened up my case to rehearse a little, practice a little, and found that the thing had come unglued because it was hot in the high humidity. No way I could play my Strad. So I asked them to find me a violin. And in a hurry, he called us after four o'clock and his concert was at, at 7.30 or eight. And they came up with an aluminum violin. Now, it didn't look like an aluminum violin because they'd pasted little wood pieces all over it and made it look like a wooden violin. So he played his concert on an aluminum violin. And he said it was a very challenge because he had to compensate for the deficiencies in the violin. Some notes were too loud and some were not, didn't come out, and he had to sort of figure out how to balance these. And he said when he got through, he quick locked it up. People came up and said, how good your Strad sounded. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a great story. But, but to prove that a great performer can do a lot with an instrument. Absolutely. Now, I did ask him, what is the real difference in your mind between these new violins and the old ones? He said, ease of playing. He says the old violins are much easier to excite and to, to express what I'm doing than the modern ones. So he was emphasizing ease of getting the sound out of them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has to do with just the age of the wood um, and that the newer ones just need time? Well, there yes, I think uh, there were some happy coincidences. They got the right wood and they got the right varnish that aged right with time and of course, these violins have been puttered with, too, through the years. None of those old violins are like they were when they were made. They've changed the, the uh, in many cases, they've changed even the, the what do you call the it? The bass bar inside? Well, the bass bar inside, I think it's just a, the, 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 the fingerboard. Fingerboard is the word yeah. I want. They changed the fingerboard even often. I made it different length a little bit on those instruments. Right. And then they... Uh, change the, the base board and the, and the peg inside, the base peg inside. Yeah. And these things are all... Or the all sound post, they call it. Sound them. post. Yeah. These were all moved around and changed with time. So these instruments are probably not the same instrument. But good musicians have had those changes made, and they have helped the, the violin makers who did these changes understand how to make them sound good. And then with the natural wood and varnish and everything, the tone came out better than than anybody could hope for. And you would say, well, maybe they aren't that different. But there was a, a, a demonstration in Philadelphia that I didn't get to, but Hunt did and told me about it. I think Saunders was there too, the two professors from Harvard. And they said that the, the, the demonstration was they put a curtain up and then they had various violins played behind the curtain. And each of them played the same thing, 
I don't know whether it was a piece or scales or what their demonstration was, but they, they did the same thing on all the violins, and they had some ten violins in this demonstration. And in the audience, they had people judge whether they were hearing old violins or, or modern violins. And only one man got them all right. So the differences aren't that great. There were a lot of listeners there. They're professional musicians and so on. And it's true that the all of the old violins were judged as being very good, but also were some of the new ones. But only one guy got them all right. He got them separated, the new from the old. Wow, interesting, interesting. While you were teaching at MIT, did you do teach any architectural acoustics or concert hall uh, acoustics? Well, only as part of my course. Mm -hmm. I used to used to spend a couple of lectures on it, mm -hmm. but I did not. Well, now one year, Bolt asked me to come over and speak at the course in architectural acoustics, but he mainly did that teaching, mm -hmm. and then Newman did too afterwards right. because Newman became a student of Bolt. Right, and that was Robert Newman. Yeah. Robert Newman. Right. Right. Um, we'll arrange for another, uh, a second session. That's okay. Okay? It's an honor to have you today, so Why thank don't we, you. Do you want to figure out a session? Sure. Let me turn the tape recorder off here.